But by the time I was 12 years old, I had another image problem. Because by that time, my mother thought that perhaps one day I could be the next accordion player for the Lawrence Welk Orchestra. I don't know how she got that impression. Those of you who don't know who Lawrence Welk is, your life is probably a little better off for not knowing. But at any rate, so at 12 years old, completely on the down low, I became an accordion player. And I practiced every day. And while my friends were out playing baseball, I was inside playing the beer barrel polka. And uh, I didn't want anybody to know this. Because had my friends found out about it, I would have been toast. So you see, even at a young age, I was a little bit into this personal branding thing, although I didn't call it that. It's not only about or so much about managing your image as it is about increasing your influence as a human being and trying to make a difference in the world somehow, some way, in this little way, in a big way, in some way. Said another way, it's really about increasing your sphere of influence. In our lives, there are things we can control. There are things, more things that are out of our control. But there are things that we can influence. There are things that we can do to increase that sphere of influence. And that's really the objective of personal branding. That's what I'm here to talk about today, is increasing your sphere of influence, being more persuasive, and doing more to connect with people, as, as was told earlier, uh, in order to do so. Now, I should tell you that I'm not a life coach. God knows I'm not a psychologist. I'm a branding guy. I spent the last 30 some years in working on uh, major brands throughout the country. I've also worked on smaller family-owned brands, so it's really run the gamut. And it's from that background that I'm going to come to you and talk to you as if you were the CEO or marketing director of a company, except you are, because you are the company and you are the brand of that company. Next lesson, how do you create a brand? This is a very short lesson, it's one word long, pay close attention, don't. Don't. Which goes to lesson three, brands are not created, they are found, especially personal brands. And this is a key point. Let me give you an example from the real world. I should say real world, this is the real world, but from the commercial world. Oldsmobile. Are you familiar with this car brand? No longer exists, but at one time it was the number three car in the country. And it was at that time they decided, gee, we could be number two. We just need to appeal to more people. So they said, you know what? We are considered to be like the poor man's Cadillac. And you know we're never going to displace Cadillac. So why don't we just appeal to the youth? You know, let's, let's be hip and cool. And you know, let's tell people that what they did tell is, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. There was only one problem. It was your father's Oldsmobile. Okay, and I can see both sides of this because I've seen brands change. You know, Old Spice used to be my father's aftershave lotion. Now it's my grandson's. <laughs> Target used to be, you know, this uh, downscale sort of discount place. And then it became Target, right? And it's the, it's the yuppie hangout. It's fashion for the masses. They've done an amazing job of changing. I've seen people change. You've seen people change, but the, in all cases, change is never fast. It's always an evolution, and it's always a risk. So I say that sometimes the best way to make a difference is to appreciate the difference you already made. And they had 60-second commercials, and this is what I saw. And it really started me thinking. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, 
glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. You know, at the time I saw this, I thought it was a public service announcement. And then I saw the Apple logo at the back, and I went, wait a minute, that was an Apple commercial? Where's the USP? Where's the computers? You know, why, why should I buy an Apple versus a, you know, somebody else's? It, it, it just baffled me because it was so against what I had learned I should do as a marketing person. But I will tell you that this commercial changed my life. It's pretty bad when you have to say a commercial changed your life, but it did. And it really started me thinking about things in a whole lot different. In fact, I will tell you, I think this is one of the greatest commercials ever made. Because what it did was it didn't communicate a unique selling proposition. It, can, it communicated a point of view, an attitude, a belief, a value, a worldview, a philosophy. There's a million words for it, but that's what it was. It wasn't something, it wasn't a benefit. It wasn't a, something that was going to solve a problem for me. It was something I was going to be able to associate with something I could recognize in myself, I could identify with. So I came out of that, and not the next day, but over time, I, I got to thinking, you know, you got to have a unique selling proposition. I still kind of, you know, this is a leftover from the past. You still have to be unique and provide something that's unique, all right? But more importantly, you also have to have this value proposition. you got to have something you stand for beyond something that's functional, all right? You know, it's interesting, this happens all the time. Think about this, everything you do when you're purchasing, you, you, know, you, you may think it's a, being done on a rational basis, but it's not. It's really an emotional, it's the same with dealing with people. When I was uh, going back to Burger King, we pitched that business, I was at a New York agency, and we had, there were 100 agencies that were sent out what called a, uh, request for proposals, and that's the, you know, just fill out the forms and tell them how great you are and if they like what you say. You don't have any contact, you just other than in writing. And you, if they see, yeah, this looks like a good agency, let's talk to them, then you make you know, the cut, all right? So there were 100 agencies vying for this $200 million account, the biggest account pitch ever in the history of advertising. At, this, at, at that time, okay, they've gone well beyond 200 million, but this time it was a big, big deal. And we made the cut. And there were five agencies. Four agencies had fast food experience. We had none. Zero, nada. In fact, I was the only person in the agency that had any, and I had only worked eight months on McDonald's prior to this. Right? And I was just a little Cub Scout in the business, but they called me up to uh, New York, and all the big guys are in there, and they're sitting around the table and go, hey, Jim, tell us about fast food. Now, this is the director of client services, the president, the creative director, all these guys that were pretty famous in their own right, and they're asking little old me to tell them and teach them about fast food so that they could possibly win the Burger King account. And I'm thinking, that I work for the craziest place in the world. So I'm... I say, well, what do you want to know? I said, well, just throw out some jargon. Like, like what? Like, like tell us about what fast food restaurants, you know, what, 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 just give us the language. Like, drive through? Yeah, drive through. Drive through. Write that down. Like, like, visitation? Yeah, that's a good one. And I'm thinking to myself, this is insane. There is no way that this agency is going to win this account. So we gave the pitch. I wasn't in it. And we won. And the day the president came over to the agency, to, to the president of Burger King came over to the agency to tell us that we had won, he gave a little speech. His speech went like this. He said, guys, you know, when I was sitting there listening to your presentation, I wasn't sure if you'd be able to tell a hamburger from a milkshake. But there was one thing that I knew. You know people. And you are like us. 
you are the people, your, your people are very much in, in line with our values and our beliefs. You can always learn fast food, but you can't teach somebody that, so that's why you're hired. Holy cow. You know, I mean, in my business, ideas always count. When we ever give a new business presentation, it's always important to, to be able to say, oh, we're going to move your business forward because we've got this new idea. Fine. But 99.99999% of the time, it's chemistry. It's connection. You know, and again, there's only so much you can control. You can't connect with everybody. But if there is a sharing of beliefs and a sharing of values, there's going to be a connection. The trick is to let them know what your beliefs and values are you look up to. Chances are you're going to look up to them not for so much what they did, but what they believe. Pick any sports hero. I play some tennis. One of my guys is Andre Agassi. Andre Agassi was not a, uh, you know, he, he started out, he's a natural born tennis player. I mean, this guy just could you know, grab a racket and it was 6060. I mean, all the time. His dad saw this and got, wow, this kid could make us a lot of money. So he sent him to all these schools and did all this stuff, and Agassi hated it. Actually hated tennis until he got a little older. And you know, the fact is, he ended up winning eight Grand Slams. He was a good tennis player. I'd say actually a great tennis player. Not as great as some of the others. Venus is what, up to 14, 15 Grand Slams? I don't know. Losing count. Okay, but he's far from being the best. But I like this guy because you know what I've heard about him? All of the winnings from his tournaments, every single dollar went into building a school for underprivileged kids. Can you imagine that? Now, I mean, obviously he made a lot of money on endorsements that allowed him to do that. But how many athletes do that? All your winnings from the sport you play in, you put into something like that. That's why I admire that guy. It's his ideal, it's what he believes in. Not so much that he was a good tennis player, of course that's what drew me to him, and I like that fact about him. And I looked up to the way he played tennis, but what I really looked up to was what he did for others. It is a combination of, when I talk about this in the book, it's a little more complicated than this, but all of us, like characters in a story, uh, if you talk to an author, what they'll tell you is that characters have layers. And on the outer layer is what they do, it's their behavior, it's, um, I'm trying to think of a good movie example, it's, um, okay, Breaking Bad. Familiar with Breaking Bad? Um, here's a guy, he cooked meth, he sold meth, he went from being a, a school teacher to a very wealthy man, but he didn't know what to do with the money and he died. That's the outer layer. The inner layer is, Here's a guy who's a school teacher who wasn't making very much money. He was dying of cancer, and he had to do something for his family. He had to get money, accumulate for his family. So the only way he knew how to do it was not through teaching. He had to do it through something that was illegal, and that was cooking meth, which he could do very well. But it also gave him some power that he needed because he had lost an opportunity to become a very wealthy man with two partners who he met in college that actually turned their back on him and went off and did their own thing. So it was in a way, it was a revenge thing. It was like, oh, I gotta get back at this, I got, and then all of a sudden, I won't tell you the end if you haven't seen it, um, you know, his motivation changes. Now, which is the most interesting story? You could have anybody be a school teacher making meth, selling meth, you know, but what made that story interesting was the inner layer. It's the motivation. It's the reason why. And it's the thing that makes people most interesting to us. Values, human values. You just get a list. Check off. You know, I'm honest and uh, not this one. Oh, that integrity. And all of a sudden you'll get a better idea of what you really believe in so that you can write that I am statement. And it's really important to do that, as I learned, because if you don't stand for something, if you don't have a clear vision of what you're all about, you will fall for anything. And I learned this one the hard way. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made in business, I made by not knowing what I stood for. I, <clears throat> this is a true story. 
I was, I had just started my agency about 15 years ago. We were two, three years in business, had six, seven people, and we were starving. We didn't know where we were gonna get the next account or how we were gonna do it. In fact, we didn't know how we were gonna survive. And if we didn't do something soon, we were gonna go out of business. So one day, this woman walked into my office and she, I thought, was the answer to my prayers. She said, you know, I, uh, I, I have an agency and we have one account left and you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of phase out of the business here, but here's the deal. If you take on this account and give me the support staff I need, I'll let you keep the profits. What? So I did the math and sure enough, oh, it's gonna be very profitable. And I'm thinking like, all right. Announced to the staff the next day, hey, you know, we've got this new opportunity here. And I turn it over to, a loop. I'm not gonna tell you her name. <laughs> I turn it over to, uh, well, let's just call her Mary. And uh, Mary stands up there and she says, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Number one, I need people here at nine o'clock in the morning, precisely at nine. I don't want anybody here at 8.55. I don't, I'm like, I'm in shock. That was her hello, and it went downhill from there. The copy machine was too old. The IT support was archaic. The support staff was non-responsive, and it went on every single day. She even came into my office one day, and she told me the hand soap in the kitchen smelled. Now, that really pissed me off. <laughs> I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I had created civil war in the office because she had polarized people. You know, there's those who are, I'll do anything she wants. She can, she'll, she'll promote me if I do. And those are like, God, I'm getting another job. And it really created havoc. What do I do? I have a contract with this woman. I can't get out of it. Well, one day she came to my office and said, well, I have some bad news for you. And that is I lost the account. And I'm like, oh, God. Oh, that means you have to, you have to leave? Yeah, I'm afraid I do. Oh, gee. <laughs> and she left. But I learned from that, I didn't stand for anything. The only thing I stood for was survival. I didn't stand for, hey, what's this agency about? What are these people about? What kind of a culture do I want? What do I believe in? What kind of people do I want to attract to this agency on the basis of beliefs and shared values? I didn't think about that. And the truth is, okay, I did survive for a little while, but if I had to go back in time, given what happened to my agency and what almost happened to friends of mine who stayed with me for the last 15 years, I would have rather gone out of business than work with her. That's how bad it was, and I'm saving you some, some horror stories here. But that's what happens when you don't know what you stand for. Well, and, and really deciding who you are, man, I don't know. It took me a long time. I'm still not, you know, I'm still learning. I'm still evolving. We always are. Till I die, I will be. So I, I'm fleshing out that, that definition. I'm adding to it all the time. This is not easy stuff, and it's ongoing, okay? But as Ralph Waldo Emerson said, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment, and how true that is. While you're trying to figure this out, all right, you are going to be, as I was, tempted to be something that you're not to do what Oldsmobile did, you know, to, to become that young, hip, whatever, you know, to try to be funny if I'm not funny, to try to be serious if I'm not serious, to try to be this or that and the other thing. You just, you're much better finding out what you're about and making the very most of it before taking the risk and trying to impress people by being something that you're not. The people lesson, that's a product lesson, that's a brand lesson, that's a service lesson. You know, and it's the biggest lesson that I've learned in my 30 years of, of doing this. So, thank you very much.